giant factory pig farms have flooded the EU market with cheap pork. To compete, small and medium-sized pig farms are under huge pressure to get ever bigger or go out of business. But do we want this type of farming in our neighbourhoods when a substantial amount of hard evidence has proved that greater herd size leads to higher levels of disease? There are a large number of problems associated with intensive livestock farming. It produces cheap uh, meat, but one has to ask whether, that, whether we can really afford to eat meat as cheap as that because the, the costs are paid for elsewhere, through the National Health Service, through pollution of watercourses, through the environment and uh, through our own health. One of the big weaknesses of the system is a heavy dependence on antibiotics and the fact that that causes um, infections which can spread from animals to humans such as Salmonella, E. coli, um, Campylobacter and even MRSA to become resistant to antibiotics which are important in human medicine. Because when that happens it means that we can go into hospital and the drugs which doctors want to use can't be used because they don't work or they don't work well enough. The use of antibiotics in um, intensive pig production is endemic. Uh, it's really, you cannot keep pigs as unnaturally as they are kept. Pigs are happy animals that like to be outside digging up the ground in the fresh air. If you stick large numbers into um, confined spaces, diseases will develop and they will spread very rapidly. And the only way to prevent that is to put them on antibiotics all the time. Now, baby pigs are taken off their mothers suddenly when they're three weeks of age. And that's a very stressful time for a pig. They've got no natural immunity to disease. Um, they really don't start to have their own um, immune systems until they're about seven or eight weeks of age. During a pig's six-month life, it, it's likely to have six or eight different antibiotics put into its feed at different times. Studies have shown that people who live within half a mile of these pig farms are coming into contact with larger numbers of these drug-resistant bacteria just through the air they breathe. They can spread through the water supply from runoff from the, the slurry. They can spread on the land where the manures, the slurry is spread on the land and that could then contaminate crops so that even vegetarians can be affected by these problems. One of the main ways they spread is to workers in the pig industry, so people who are actually handling the pigs will become contaminated with drug-resistant bacteria, then their family members can become affected, and then people who are in contact with their family members, so these problems can stasy chain through society in that way. One of the um, things that I think most people have heard is that growth-promoting antibiotics were banned throughout the European Union a few years ago. But what not everyone realises is that in fact antibiotics are still being used just as much as ever they were in pig feed because they're allowed to be used to prevent disease. That was the front page of the Farmer's Stock Breeder in 1968. Um, the great pig race. Ready, steady, grow! <laughs> um, and it's this image of sort of pigs get, you know, getting off to a flying start. And so even that you know, was banned Back in the 70s, we banned a few drugs, but we've, we brought some new ones in to replace them. If you just look at this advertisement here, this is for an, an, an antibiotic um, which is given to pigs on a regular basis, and it's get showing getting them off to a flying start. And this is given, this is, this is a, a publication which goes straight to pig farmers. This is actually trying to encourage them to buy more antibiotics than they want to do anyway. And believe you me, they're not, they're not slow at picking up the phone to the veterinary surgeon saying they want, they want a prescription for, anti for, for, for the drugs they think they need anyway. Some of the antibiotics that are used in pig production are almost exactly the same as those which are used in human medicine to treat um, serious diseases. And even the ones which are different are quite often capable of causing what's known as cross-resistance. So the antibiotics are sufficiently alike to actually mean that the ones, the drugs used in human medicine don't work or don't work as well as they should do. The predictions are, in some cases, that we're down, going to be down to um, sort of just one drug that still works in human medicine. And if that um, begins to have problems, then we've got nowhere else to go. Meat, which may appear very cheap, is in fact very, very expensive. And in some cases, that could be at the cost of our own lives. We haven't had a new type of antibiotic, a new class of antibiotics for more than a decade now. 
And it's very difficult to see that um, we're going to find new antibiotics that would have the same effect as ones that we've, we've had in the past, such as penicillin, um, which has saved millions of lives down the years. And there just isn't that level of research into finding new agents. So I think we have to be more careful with the ones that we have now and how we're, um, how we're forcing the evolution of these uh, strains such as these MRSA strains to become increasingly resistant to the antibiotics that we have. Because there won't be anything left in the cupboard in uh, a few decades down the line, um, which may um, really point to a, a less intensified um, system of farming where body mass um, increases are, are not the, the prime driver. It's not all economics. And we are having a, a long view in terms of human health. In May 2011, the European Parliament issued a call for more research and better monitoring of the effects of antimicrobials on food-producing animals. Uh, my name is uh, Colleen Noonan. I uh, represent the Soil Association, the organic farming organisation in the UK, and I'd like to thank uh, Tracy for having invited me to, to speak here. So I'm here to speak about the human health consequences of the overuse of antibiotics in farming. Sometimes we hear from the industry that there, are, there is no evidence at all that uh, farm animal use contributes to resistance in human medicine. However, both uh, the World Health Organization and EFSA have concluded that there is clear evidence that some human resistance does come from the farm animal uh, antibiotic use. There was a recent Dutch report by the, uh, their Food Standards Agency which estimated that in the Netherlands, 30 to 50% of resistance in humans comes from farm animals. Um, so dealing with uh, MRSA, which is one of the best known uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, in most countries and certainly up until very recently, MRSA was mainly associated with the hospital use of antibiotics, not with farm animal use. However, in the past decade, um, a new strain of MRSA has emerged in pigs mainly, but also in poultry and in some dairy calves. Uh, this strain is called ST398 and it's widespread in many continental EU countries. Um, it spreads uh, to humans, particularly farm workers or vets, and uh, it can cause serious infections including deaths. And it is so widespread in pigs that some scientists are concerned that it will have the opportunity to mutate and become even more dangerous to humans in the future. Other examples of uh, resistant bacteria which can get their resistance in farm animals and then infect humans are Salmonella and Campylobacter, and most resistance in these uh, uh, bacteria actually comes from farm animal use, it mainly does not come from human use, uh, but it can cause serious problems in human medicine. Uh, with E. coli, it's more complicated and it's hard to say exactly where, where it is coming from. Nevertheless, we do know that some definitely comes from farm animals, and this is significant, particularly because there are now these highly resistant, a, a new form of E. coli which is highly resistant called ESBL E. coli, and which is present in livestock in Europe. And ESBL E. coli, although it's not as well known as MRSA in many countries, it already kills many more people than MRSA. The second major problem is the increase of certain pathogens. So the oral use of certain antibiotics can kill off good bacteria in the animal's gut, allowing other bacteria then to move in and, and become more widespread. The first example of this is Clostridium difficile, which until recently was mainly a, a hospital problem, but now in Europe there is a new hypervirulent strain of Clostridium difficile um, called 078, which is present uh, mainly in European pigs, and despite being virtually unknown in human medicine just a few years ago, it's become the third most common strain now in humans in, in, uh, throughout Europe. So it's uh, potentially a major uh, uh, a pathogen that is coming from intensive farming to, to humans. Imagine waking up every morning realizing that your quality of life depends on which way the wind happens to be blowing that day, whether or not you can even go outside. That's one of the reasons I went on to study agriculture and then medicine, because how we treat animals can have global public health implications. Farm animals were 
domesticated millennia ago, but never before like this. The industrialization of animal agriculture um, it represents the most profound alteration of the human-animal relationship in you know, 10,000 years, and no surprise, they have been shown repeatedly to be breeding grounds for disease. 2005, the emergence in China of the deadliest strain ever of Streptococcus suis, causing deafness and meningitis and people affecting people handling uh, uh, affected pork products, and the World Health Organization blamed its emergence on factory farming. Pig factories in Malaysia birthed the Nipah virus, one of the deadliest of human pathogens, causing relapsing brain infections, killing 40% of the people that it affects, and its emergence, again, blamed on factory farming. In 2008, a strain of airborne Ebola virus was found in factory farm pigs in the Philippines. In 2009, MRSA, the antibiotic-resistant superbug that you heard about, now killing more people than AIDS every year in the United States, was found in 50% of the pigs in, tested in Iowa. Later that year, it was detected in the retail pork supply here in the United States, right off of supermarket shelves. And in 2010, the toll of the swine flu pandemic was collated, according to the Centers for Disease Control, 10,000 Americans dead, mostly young people. And these just examples from pigs, and just over the last five years or so, don't have time to talk about the other diseases killing people linked to factory farms, mad cow, bird flu. We are, we are in a new age, right? It used to be, look, you don't want a factory farm disease. Don't live near a factory farm. Don't eat factory farm meat. But now things are different. Now with a disease like swine flu, a, uh, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you eat. Right? A disease can emerge in a factory farm, spread around the world in days, weeks. Right? So when people learn what's going on, they're outraged. And when they are empowered to affect change, they make the right choice over and over and by a wide margin. Right? In fact, well, we even went back to the state I grew up in. Arizona, and faced off head-to-head -head with the very factory farm which, which uh, so affected my childhood. And by the citizens of that state, that factory farm was soundly defeated. When animal protection groups line up with sustainable agriculture groups and environmentalists right, and producers and food safety organizations and religious leaders and business owners, there's nothing that we cannot achieve. Today is a historic day. PAMTA, the Preservation of Antibiotics for Medical Treatment Act, was reintroduced today by Representative Slaughter. This, uh, uh, you know, most antibiotics produced in the country don't go to treat sick people. They're fed by the truckload to farm animals just to promote growth and prevent diseases in such a stressful, overcrowded, unhygienic environment. This legislation to restrict the mass feeding of antibiotics to farm animals is endorsed by 377 organizations, the American Medical Association, the American Public Health Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and, and every major human um, medical and public health organization in the country, and only opposed by the likes of the National Chicken Council, the National Pork Producers, United Egg Producers, the American Sheep Industry Association. The contrast could not be more stark. Uh, the only reason there continues to be a debate on this issue is that uh, the public health community is up against uh, two of the most powerful lobbies, not just agribusiness, but also the pharmaceutical industry as well. When we started doing this work, there were 27,500 individual family farmers, hog farmers, in the state of North Carolina. Today, there's 2,200 factory farms. They've been altogether replaced. 80% of those are owned or controlled by one corporation, Smithfield Foods. So you have the landscapes of America being dominated by, by corporate power and, and driving human beings. Part of their business plan is to drive human beings off those landscapes. I've always said this. We're not protecting the environment for the sake of the fishes and the birds. We protect it for our own sake because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our communities and that if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us. We've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, 
the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, the, 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 the commons, the commonwealth, the public trust assets, those things that are not susceptible to private property ownership, but by their nature are the, are the assets of the entire community. What I've been trying to do over the last 20 something years is the complete antithesis of what you've seen this, uh, this evening in the film clips. For me and other organic farmers, uh, our pigs are integrated into our fertility building systems in a way that benefits the environment, benefits human and pig welfare. Our 200 saddleback sows and their piglets rotate across around 120 acres each year, rooting up old clover lays uh, as, uh, to, to, to get them ready for the, the wheat crops that will follow. They're very much integrated into our cropping cycle. Their manure is precious. It's not a waste. It's not a noxious waste. It is uh, something that we value as farmers because it provides the fertility for our cropping cycle. The pigs are very healthy. All that uh, clean pasture, uh, fresh air, uh, late weaning, we don't wean until they're eight weeks old, and a really low stress system, as you can see here, um, means that antibiotics are really very, very rarely ne needed. We produce about three and a half thousand pigs <coughs> a year on our farm, and we probably use antibiotics at the most on five to ten individual pigs in that year. The pigs are able to express all their innate behaviours, such as rooting, uh, nesting uh, before they give birth, caring for their young properly, gently bickering, there's plenty of that, and playing, and, and, and don't they play, pigs? I think people, when they come onto our farm for the first time, are just amazed by the play behavior. They've never seen pigs scampering around the place like a packs of puppies. Uh, they are so exuberant. And I think uh, whether you know pigs or not, when you see pigs behaving in that way, uh, you know uh, that they're having a good time, if we're allowed to use that phrase. No, it's not scientific. We never need to cut their teeth or tails. Um, they're far too busy. My staff always say to me when I say, oh, should we bring them a bit in a bit earlier? We'll bring them in for the last week or two before they finish. So no, leave them out there. They're much better. They're like kids, you know. Get them outdoors. They're much happier if they're outside. Although our meat is more expensive, and we do do it organically, so it is more expensive, our customers really respond to the quality of what we're producing. And I will always say to them, uh, actually, enjoy it, eat a little less. A little goes a long way. We don't eat, need to eat as much meat as we do. Maybe we should be eating less but better quality. So I would say to people who care about pig production, just make sure that you continue to eat pork that comes from farms like these. There are, there are, there are a lot in the country now, and we must be supporting them. The consumer ultimately has the power. They can say whether they buy cheap pork, that they don't care where it's produced or how it's produced or the quality of it. But ultimately, if the consumer refuses to buy that and prefers to buy meat which is a high welfare standard produced in an environmentally sensitive way, then we'll be on to a winner, you know. <laughs>